Just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should. And I think what's so hard is that, again, we look at people's intentions, that they want life. And so that's a very understandable and also very common refrain is that I, I just want to have a baby. Only 7% of all embryos lead to a live birth. What that means is that the remaining 93% are either destroyed or they're frozen somewhere for who knows how long. And that's when we start feeling and sensing that this is not a path that we should go down. There's estimated over a million embryos still in storage in the United States. One million. Over a million, yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today, we're going to have a great guest back in studio that we had on the show last year, Dr. Lauren Rubal. Dr. Lauren Rubal is an obstetrician gynecologist with years of experience, but she's got a fascinating personal story. And last year we talked about her journey from going from being an IVF doctor to a holistic fertility care physician. So Dr. Rubal is going to break down how IVF actually works. There's a lot of information that I think is missed in some of these media stories and in the common conversation about it. And she's going to break down the risks, the harms, not just to the child, to these embryos, but also to the parents. These are the things that anybody, anybody who is considering IVF should know before they go through the process of it. And this is something that if you have friends or family that is considering IVF or has practiced IVF, has done IVF, they deserve to know this information too. Goodranchers.com is American meat delivered. Did you know that 90% of the meat in your grocery store doesn't come from the United States, even if the meat packages say product of the USA on it? That's a little trick that a lot of meat manufacturers use as they import it from other countries and then they can slap on product of the USA. Not so with Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is sourcing 100% of its meat, poultry, pork, and seafood products directly from US ranchers. And you can tell by the products. The beef is just better. The chicken is delicious. You're not going to find chicken like Good Ranchers chicken at the grocery store. Usually it's stringy or it's rubbery. It's not as flavorful. Good Ranchers chicken is delicious. Good Ranchers also has a very special deal going on right now that if you order a subscription box of meat and chicken, you will get free chicken for an entire year, an additional two plus pounds of chicken per box. You can get that great deal by using the code Lila at checkout at GoodRanchers.com. Check them out. You won't regret it. That's GoodRanchers.com, and you can use the code Lila at checkout for a year's supply of free chicken. Dr. Lauren Rubal, thanks for coming back on the podcast. Yes, thank you for having me, Lila. I'm so happy to be here. So we're, we're friends off camera, so I'm calling you Dr. Lauren Rubal so people know your title, but... <laughs> You're, you're awesome. Everyone, it's been so fun getting to know you since moving out here. Same, same. Absolutely. So, and I, mean, I know people that go to you as a doctor, mm -hmm. and we're going to get into your work as a doctor in another episode, but this is all about IVF. Yes. Because that has been very much a controversial news item recently, and I think there's a ton of misinformation swirling about it and confusion about it. Yes. So I'm excited for you to set the record straight for people. Yes, I'm excited to talk about it. And I think that we have to always preface this mm -hmm. by remembering the great pain and suffering that these couples who have infertility mm -hmm. are enduring. And I think that part of the controversy, quite honestly, that occurs with IVF is just because it can feel very personal, mm -hmm. right? And and people are already so very um, understandably emotional and sad and sorrowing about their diagnoses. But I think at the same time, we have to be able to look at objective truth to be able to create a, and forge a path mm. forward. So give po folks your background and your background too as a doctor. Yes, absolutely. So I am an OBGYN. So that means I did four years of residency mm -hmm. after medical school. And then after that, I did a three-year fellowship, which means further training in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. And so... That's a very fancy way of saying that I help women who have hormone imbalances. Mm -hmm. Hormones are simply messengers that allow the brain to talk to the other organs and for them to talk back. Um, and so I look at those hormones, especially in relation to reproduction, number one. And number two, I help couples who are dealing with that process of difficulty conceiving or who have had multiple miscarriages, things like that. And so in that... Um, I practiced as a full scope REI for about seven years doing it all. So I did perform in vitro fertilization or IVF within that, um, within that job. 
And we did an episode last year. Mm-hmm. You're one of the OG uh, folks <laughs> yeah. on the podcast. Awesome. You did an awesome job explaining some of your background. You have an amazing personal story, but you talked about how you used to work and do a multiple, you know, multiple things, but one of them was IVF. Mm-hmm. And then your process of deciding, no, I'm not going to continue to do IVF. Just for folks who haven't heard that yet, give us the the high level of that process for you, why you decided to ultimately leave that approach to fertility, infertility care, doing IVF, and now you're on a, obviously a, a new track. Yes, and I think this ties into really, again, the issues that IVF engenders, okay? And so I would say that the, what is IVF is kind of the first question. And so what that entails is that um, physicians give a woman multiple injections of fertility medications on a daily basis for a process of about two weeks or more, depending on the type of what we call protocol that they're on. Um, and that those medications mm-hmm. allow multiple eggs to mature within the ovaries. And instead of those eggs getting released and ovulated, they instead are removed. And so that is a minor procedure where um, there is an ultrasound guided needle placed through the vagina into each of those follicles and to suction out each of those eggs. And that's done in every follicle that is um, present in both ovaries, typically. Those eggs are then taken by an embryologist who then handles them, determines which are what we call mature. Um, And then those eggs are combined with sperm, many times in a process that's called ICSI, which is simply when the embryologist will select a sperm that they deem is looks normal um, by its shape and also is moving in a normal fashion, meaning forward. And they'll um, physically place that sperm and inject it into the egg to try to help with fertilization. And so that's done. And then the next day, they'll put each of those in a Petri dish. And the next day, about 80% of them will have fertilized. And so this is the ultimate issue. I want to pause to acknowledge that in 80%, in eight of those 10 dishes, for example, there is now a fertilized egg, which is an embryo, which is a genetically unique, substantially whole human being with its own set or his or her own set of chromosomes that will then encode for every cell and that will then over the process of the next few days divide from one cell into hundreds. So I just want to stop there for a minute just to have us remember that fact. And so anyway, those embryos are then watched over a period of days and they have one of three fates at that point. They will either get um, transferred back immediately, uh, three to five days later, typically, into the woman's uterus um, using a catheter. And um, then the woman will find out if she has a positive pregnancy test a couple of weeks after that, roughly. That's fate one. The second possibility is that they will be biopsied. They will have some of their cells removed, and typically those cells will undergo what we call chromosome screening. So they'll be sent off to a lab, and the chromosomes will be screened to see if they're deemed chromosomally euploid or containing the correct copy number of chromosomes. That's the second possibility. The third possibility is they'll be flash frozen and placed in liquid nitrogen canisters to be stored there potentially indefinitely. And so that, in a nutshell, is the process of IVF. And mm-hmm. The process, the, so going through each of those different processes, and I, it, I mean, it's, it, it, thank you for explaining it so clearly, because I think we talk about this and people have different understandings of what we mean, and it's just very helpful to know exactly the, each step of that process. So for those, those three additional processes of, Mm -hmm. you know, after the fertilization takes place, you have this tiny little embryo. Um, Let's start with maybe the second one. You mentioned some are biopsied for then chromosomal screening. screening. Mm -hmm. That also would include gender selection as well. And what else, what else, how far, how much chromosomal screening can you do with a, you know, just a couple cells of a tiny little biopsied embryo? And how is it typically used? Well, Lila, it's 
you know, used with our current technology. But I think that an important part when we develop any new technology Mm -hmm. is to not look only at what can currently be done, but what Mm -hmm. is a possibility in the future. So the current landscape, um, actually, to be honest with you, chromosome screening of embryos is has been going on for more than a decade, okay? And uh, so what was the premise is that, oh, if we can have an embryo that is deemed chromosomally normal, because we know that the majority of miscarriages that occur in the first trimester are due to um, what we call random errors within the Mm -hmm. embryo, him or herself. And so because of that, that embryo cannot continue to grow and divide um, in terms of their cells, Mm -hmm. and then a miscarriage occurs, okay? And so with that being said, if we can, if the, the thought was that, oh, well, if we can just place back those chromosomally normal embryos, we'll mm-hmm. improve um, chance of pregnancy or we'll decrease the risk of miscarriage. And so again, with the current technology, that is what happens the majority of the time is that they're being used for what we call pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, which is um, abnormal chromosomes. The more uh, the lesser used is for specific genetic issues that they are looking um, very precisely at that gene. But for the majority of them, again, this has been going on for a while. And this, the current iteration of it is actually um, not the original. In fact, the original, um, which is called FISH, or fluorescent in situ hybridization, lots and lots of acronyms. Mm -hmm. Um, But what that entails is, um, was or what it was found, instead of giving you a process of what that means, because it is very complex, um, was that, in fact, when they, it was quickly adopted because the premise seemed to be very promising. They did a randomized controlled trial, which is a very uh, well-respected study design of, of scientific research. And they found, in fact, that the premise was not correct, at least for fish, for that original type of chromosome screening. And in fact, the women who had undergone, um, well, I should say the embryos, who had undergone that fish screening, those couples, that woman, actually had no improvement in pregnancy rates. And what was found is that the the couples who chose or were screened or randomized rather to not have fish done had better pregnancy rates. So just to break this down, this is so interesting. You're saying that originally this whole idea of the testing of the embryo's genetics to see whether it should be actually implanted or just destroyed probably because it wasn't fit. They thought, well, it would be a miscarriage actually hasn't led to better lower miscarriage rates among IVF patients. So the original iteration certainly didn't, and there are now different ways of checking the chromosomes. But I will tell you, there was another recent study that seemed Mm -hmm. to suggest exactly what you're saying. This is not the holy grail. In fact, there was an interesting article that was published by an REI who said that PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing is a castle built on sand. So wh- why is that? Is that because they're getting the tests wrong? I mean, what what is going on there that they have such poor success rate? So there are multiple factors, okay? The mm. first factor is just like, again, any technology where there's always a chance for error, mm. fine, that we think is um, relatively low. But I think a lot of it is related to the embryo, him or herself. Why? Because in this stage of the embryo's life, Mm -hmm. it's very dynamic. There's clearly a lot of things happening. And um, we like it, I liken it almost like a soccer ball. And Mm -hmm. so what that means is there might be small areas of abnormal chromosomes, of cells that contain Mm -hmm. abnormal chromosomes, but the overall embryo, him or herself, will self-correct, will actually um, be able to be euploid. And if you biopsy, let's say a, a white area that was the abnormal mm-hmm. chromosomes, you might think that the whole embryo, that's representative of the whole embryo when that's not the case, when it's what we call a mosaic. Wow. And so that's one other possibility. And in fact, there are interesting small series, but that are starting to get published in that patients who were told that they had chromosomally screened abnormal embryos, they still had them transferred back and they had euploid live births from this. 
So it just shows the technology, uh, you know, us kind of being God, playing God here of saying, let's create the life, let's test the life at this very early stage to see if he or she is fit to even allow to continue to live. And then we're getting it wrong, it sounds like, and we have gotten it wrong. And the the, the whole point in the, the positive, you could say the good intention is, well, they want to avoid the baby being miscarried. But what, what happens to the babies or to these tiny embryos that are seen as uh, deficient chromosomally? So that's the thing. I would say that the if there is... What's the standard practice? Standard practice is not to transfer a chromosomally abnormal screened embryo. So back. what do they do with the baby then? So then th typically what would happen is that that embryo is destroyed. So it's sometimes they would opt to just continue um, that embryo being frozen. Um, so those are the two possibilities at that point. Again, in a minority of cases, there will be doctors who would be open um, to transferring that embryo still, which is again where that series mm -hmm. was derived from. So then the third case, so I, it sounds like eugenics to me. I mean, what is eugenics? It's creating a better, a cleaner genetic line that is more accepted by whatever social group is doing the work of it and wanting to be in power. And they're trying to basically weed out the undesirables. I think that when we look at it objectively, that this starts, yes, I think that that is the conclusion that can be drawn from it. And that's why we have to be a society and a culture that, again, is able to look at that objectivist, that objective truth. And I think what's so hard is that, again, we look at people's intentions and we mm -hmm. know that for the vast majority, everyone's intentions are pure, that they, that they want life. And so that's mm -hmm. a very um, understandable and also very common refrain is that I, 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 I just want to have a baby. I want to create life. But I think we also need to remember from the perspective of the embryos, that they have a very low chance of life. And so what mm -hmm. that means is there was an interesting study that came out of the UK. It's that on average about um, 10 to 15 embryos are created per cycle. Um, and out of those, only 7% of all embryos lead to a live birth. So what does that mean? What that means is that the remaining 93% are either destroyed or they're frozen somewhere for who knows how long. And that is a staggering statistic. So you bring up to 15 lives into the world on average, a cycle, and then maybe one of them will make it. Perhaps. Intentionally is the design of the, of the system is that you bring these lives and you wanna just, you need one, you want one live birth and in the process, the rest could be either destroyed or frozen. And so that's the point of the of looking at this and saying that exactly, there may be 10 embryos here. So which life are you going to choose? Mm. And that's when we start getting into that, yes, where, where you start feeling and sensing that this is not something that we want. This is not a path that we should go down. Every morning when I wake up, I love to make myself a steaming cup of seven weeks coffee. Seven weeks coffee is gourmet, small batch, low acid, ethically sourced coffee that is absolutely delicious. I love the Burundi blend and the Ethiopian medium blend. So many different choices at sevenweekscoffee.com. What I love about Seven Weeks Coffee is not just that it's delicious coffee delivered right to my door, but that Seven Weeks Coffee fuels the pro-life movement. In fact, Seven Weeks' mission is to give 10% of all of its revenue, not just its profits, directly to support pregnancy resource centers. In fact, Seven Weeks Coffee has already supported 800 pregnancy resource centers, helping moms and babies in need, and donated over $325,000. At sevenweekscoffee.com today, you can join the Heartbeat Club where you can get the lowest prices and the best discounts on your monthly subscription. You'll get 15% off a month, and when you use my code Lila at checkout, you'll get an additional 10% for 25% off your first order. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, order yourself an amazing subscription of coffee, try out your favorite blend, and get 25% off your first order by using the code Lila at checkout. There was a famous um, YouTuber, there is a famous YouTuber, mm -hmm. um, same-sex couple mm -hmm. on YouTube, and his name's Shane Dawson. He has this very checkered past of saying very sexual exploitative things about children and making jokes about sexually exploiting children. So it's very concerning that he came uh, out recently in the last year saying he was going to go through 
surrogacy process, IVF process, and have a child, basically purchase purchase a child with his partner. And he made it very public and a lot of his fans, unfortunately, there's there's some diehard adoring fans, he can do no wrong, we're so excited for him. Again, he's made jokes about molesting children before and he's molested underage girls even before on camera and, and made jokes in about sexual molestation of them. So it's very concerning. Long story short, there was a video out that he said they had I think 10 or a dozen embryos and they were kind of picking boys or girls. So it wasn't even a genetic test about your you know, chromosomal issues. It was, do we want a boy or a girl? And I think they ended up with two boys, if I remember correctly, or maybe it was a boy and a girl, and they actually have completed the process. These, these infants are with this man now. We don't know their fate. Uh, is that, how, how common is that where it's not just chromosomal testing for, as they see deficiencies, but it's also, I want specifically a boy or a girl embryo. And so I'm gonna leave the boys on ice because I want the girls or leave the girls on ice because I want the boys. I mean, I certainly was uh, participating in that. So it's not uncommon. It's called um, family completion through sex selection. And so these women who many times do not have difficulty conceiving um, undergo this process, yes. And so once they get the results back 46XX or 46XY, they will either um, freeze them or they will destroy the ones that are not the, the, the desired sex. And um, I mm -hmm. think that that brings up a complete, another point is that, again, there, the regulation behind this, and I know that was mm -hmm. what was so troubling about that particular case that you bring up, is there really is not a lot of regulation and screening, such as there is in adoption, for mm -hmm. example, right? And so these babies are, um, are being placed potentially in these situations um, that they shouldn't be. Um, absolutely, right? There was a viral story. I'm going to pull it up. This just happened. Mm -hmm. um, I think this just started making the rounds. It was, it was reported on in the last few days. There was a Chicago area vet and well-known national dog show uh, judge. His name's mm -hmm. Adam King, 36, okay. nine years old. And he had, uh, he and his same-sex partner again were going through the process of surrogacy. They were, I don't know if the baby has been born yet or is near birth, but mm -hmm. he has been arrested because he was distributing child sexual assault materials. And he was in chat rooms talking about how he was going to be taking home a baby soon and he would plan to rape his newborn. Oh, I so, know you know, it's thank God that this man has been arrested and this newborn or this preborn baby, we don't know this, the fate of this child is not going to be handed over to this man. But like you said, is there really no regulation around any kind of parental screening for those that have the means to go and basically pay a surrogate pay for eggs, use their sperm, whatever it is, and hopefully bring in their view, bring home a live baby? Not that I'm aware of. And it, really the the screening that's done is more so for the woman whose uterus they're going to use, so for the surrogate. And so that is- To make is, sure she's good enough, basically, and healthy enough. To make, there's a medical component, but there is also other types of screening, legal, of course, um, uh, proceedings that go on before the contract, while they're devising the contract, right? And so um, that is not, you know, again, we think about the medical risks these women are enduring for- um, a lot of these surrogates that I talked to, they have this desire to help others build their families. Absolutely. Um, there may be, you know, th there's a financial uh, motivation. Surrogacy cycles are, over, you know, they cost over $100,000 typically um, to That perform. the surrogate can make a big chunk of that money? I actually am not sure what the okay. breakdown is for how much the surrogate receives. I think it's in the tens of thousands. Okay. So that, yeah. so there's a discrepancy mm -hmm. there with how much those mm -hmm. um, cycles uh cost for the intended parents, which is what uh, the term is. Um, and then they're also faced with nurturing and caring for this baby. And especially there have been court cases where um, where if there is, for example, uh, something, a screening test that shows that there might be an abnormality in the baby, they then are um, against their will sometimes being forced to undergo abortions later on. And this so. is a screening mm -hmm. test that happens after 
the screening tests that they do initially. Because you mentioned mm -hmm. when, it's, when the embryo is so tiny, you're talking hundreds of cells. You're not talking about billions of cells later on. You're talking about very small embryo. If they're biopsying a part of it, they might get a false positive or a false negative in terms mm -hmm. of chromosomal issues. Once that baby's implanted, the surrogate is you know gestating this beautiful little life. And then they do other screenings to test again. Mm -hmm. And if the intended parents, the purchasing parents don't like the results of that screen, they can ask for an abortion. Yes. It's, um, I mean, it's, it, I think about the case we just talked about. I think about another case, a woman, I think her name's Brittany Pearson in California, and she was a surrogate mother. And again, felt well-intentioned, like she was trying to help people, you mm -hmm. know, also bringing some extra income for her family. And again, two men, I mean, many of these stories involve these uh, couples, these two men in this situation, again, uh, working, paying her to do this for them to have their first child. They can't have it naturally, of course. They need to use a woman's body for this. And she ends up getting breast cancer, a diagnosis during her pregnancy and wants to pursue treatment, but doesn't want to harm the child. And so is willing to do an early delivery, delay her treatment enough to do an del early delivery to give the baby a chance. Right. And the men wanted to abort. They didn't want to give the baby a chance at life because they didn't want to deal with a NICU baby. And they told her uh, that she needed to abort. She said, well, I'm willing to even take care of this child. But they didn't want a child out in the world, they said, with their DNA or one of their DNA, right? Obviously, it's just one of them. And they insisted on an abortion. And that baby ended up being killed. It was, she, he was delivered um, to preterm and he was denied medical care when he was delivered and he died. They just let him die in a hospital room. And, you know, I think about that and I think how can that not be infanticide? My, you know, just looking at that case on its face, um, it's obviously horrific either whether it's infanticide or abortion, mm -hmm. but that that was perfectly legal right. in the state of California. And, and I think the other point to that case is the point that so many different couples have to face that they haven't thought about. But at the end of the day, these couples know that those are their children, what you just mentioned. And that's what makes, again, sometimes the suffering pursues you, even you don't realize you're trying to, again, create this life, create life, have this baby. And then you end up with a surplus of embryos You've completed your family, and now you have 10 embryos left mm. frozen, and they are your children. And so you don't know what to do. And I, this is a very real situation that you, um, that you hit the nail on the head mm. of and, and alluded to, is that they don't want to have them adopted because they're their children. They don't want to destroy them because they're their children. And so what they're, they're in this quandary. And so um, as, a, as an aside, I think that we see that, that that's a very common scenario because there's estimated over a million embryos still in storage in the United States. One million. Over a million. Yeah, it's thought. So um, there are very, this is, again, not an uncommon issue. And that's just one of the issues that these embryos may face, right? And so when we think about other reasons, again, when I think about what are the issues that brought me away from what I was doing and into a completely new practice? I always say that my greatest career achievement was leaving that world and pursuing a restorative reproductive medicine and integrative gynecology practice. But it's because of the objective truth that embryos are human beings at their earliest stages Again, we know that they'll grow in a dish on their own as long as they're provided the proper nutrients and media and temperature. That's really all they need. Um, they, uh, so they're, they're humans. They're also subjected to so much, right? They're mm -hmm. subjected to potential lab error. And so that could be the embryologist. Um, there's a lot of um, touching that goes on and manipulation just by checking the embryos themselves or by the processes, like I mentioned, when, the, um, when they're undergoing ICSI or they're undergoing biopsy, or they're undergoing freezing or thawing. So there can be um, damage to the embryo that is derived from that. They can have issues with, again, the surroundings. And so if the incubator temperature is wrong or if the media is contaminated, that can damage embryos, right? Um, they can undergo uh, issues where there's those false positives um, in the chromosome screening and then be erroneously called abnormal and then 
destroyed. And so can you see that there's just so many t- areas that are not the best for our patients, that are not the best for these couples? And um, I'll tell you, I remember sitting in front of so many couples who had one embryo. We did PGT. And that embryo was deemed chromosomally normal. And I, and to say to them that that was the case, it's, it's incredibly, it's heartbreaking. And I still think about it to this day, um, all those situations, um, especially with the knowledge that I thank God have now felt like I just was in so much cognitive dissonance before. Um, and I was focused on, um, on wanting to help people. Um, but again, we have to focus on objective truth. So. so you would be sitting down with these patients and you would just have to share with them the test came back and there's a chromosomal deficiency or, or problem. Abnormality. Mm-hmm. Abnormality. And what would be the typical response in those situations? Oh, it's utter, utter. Again, it's heartbreak. For all of us in that room, I felt the same way. And again, what would they typically decide? What, what 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 was the decision that you make with that information? Typically, the decision would be that we weren't going to transfer back the embryo. And, like you said earlier, in many cases, this baby could be healthy. But even if they're not healthy, you know, you don't destroy a baby because they're not perfect. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Yep. And the, the reality is, though, this is like the real world of what is happening with, again, couples that want life. We, we love life is good. Uh, but this process that we've invited in or that we're practicing at large, like you're saying, is rife with so many risks to these babies. Um, and so many are not making it. You mentioned the million frozen embryos or million plus frozen embryos. Is there any regulation that you know of or what is the common practice when an embryo is just indefinitely frozen? I mean, well, so there's a storage fee. And so uh, that embryo will can remain frozen indefinitely. We think, um, it can, again, medically, mm-hmm. meaning as you've probably seen on the news, there are stories where there are 30-year-old embryos that are then transferred back um, and are live, live-born and um, wow. and so even you sometimes being con- created in eighteen or nineteen, yeah, you know, nineteen ninety or something, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you're you're born in two thousand and twenty three. Yeah, four. It's, it's actually you it's know crazy. so so that can happen, right? But in order for those embryos to continue to be uh, technically, they they are requiring a storage fee annually from the parents. And so I think I mentioned this even the last time that mm. sometimes people move or they, they're, they're lost to follow up is what it's called. And so it puts again, first of all, the embryos in this situation. Second of all, the, the fertility clinics then have to decide what do we do with these embryos. And th- typically they'll just remain frozen. But I think legally, because they, they do sign, they could they could destroy them at that point um, if they've made uh, good faith attempts to reach out and it's not being uh, responded to or their storage fees aren't being paid. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing diaper company. And they're also America's pro-life diaper company. These products are high quality premium baby products that are great for your little one's skin. And they also support the pro-life movement by donating money back to support mothers and babies in need. You can join a subscription service and get your diapers and wipes sent directly to your door. Check out their products. They're awesome. They're better than Pampers or Huggies or these competitors. And Pampers and Huggies and many of these competitors are pro-abortion companies that support abortion. Every Life, on the other hand, has awesome products at a great price point and supports our values and supports children. So go to everylife.com today. You can use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order and get the best products for your little one. That's everylife.com. When you were working at the IVF clinic and you're dealing every day with making life or death decisions for hundreds, maybe even thousands of these embryos, did the other people working with you have... Were, were there any kind of moral moments that they experienced where they had a moral qualm with the kind of power they were wielding and the decisions that they were making? 
I think that in the sense of grieving with the patients, mm. um, in when when someone wasn't pregnant, when we had those situations where we're sitting together and there are no embryos um, to transfer, for example, like of course there is real, real grief and love for our patients, like absolutely without a doubt. But in the sense of, again, being the ones who are guiding these people who are coming to us as experts and guiding them to give them the best, safest, um, moral way to deal with their fertility, I don't, I, I know for, I can speak for myself, I don't feel like I was able to do that. Um, and I think it was because of, again, for me, it was very much like a spiritual blindness mm -hmm. of what life is when it starts. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. here that I could be the purported expert mm -hmm. in fertility and women's health and, embryo and embryos and all of these things that I'm dealing with and still be able to just accept that, oh, life begins at implantation. Okay. No, it doesn't. I could literally see those embryos growing from day to day in those dishes. Again, from one cell to hundreds. When it, the, What happens normally? What happens normally is that the egg and the sperm meet in the tube, in the fallopian mm -hmm. tube. And then that embryo is then created in the outer part of the tube, starts dividing really mm -hmm. rapidly. By the time that embryo gets into the uterine cavity, it's a process, it's actually five days later. Mm -hmm. And that embryo, again, as I said to you, is about is hundreds of cells at that point. And so that's when we typically transfer those embryos back is on day five. Um, and so if it's a fr uh, fresh transfer. And so to know that, but not to realize that that embryo is living, to know that the chromosomes in that embryo are unique and, dis and separate and will create and will create a live born human being if if given the chance to continue to mm -hmm. do what they're doing already in that dish and to not have that be at the forefront of how we're counseling patients i think is again one of the reasons i believe that we need to have alternatives and that there are better alternatives mm -hmm. and that the practice of IVF again as i as i say all the time just because we can do something doesn't mean that we mm -hmm. should and i know I, I have to say two points i feel for people with infertility with all my heart this is why i'm doing this i truly love what i do i love walking alongside of people in the best of times and in the worst of times we cannot lose sight of the embryo. So mm. we cannot be so focused that we forget about all of these human beings that are, that are the most vulnerable, the most vulnerable, and that are not being treated the way that they should be, which is with the utmost of care because they are the most mm. vulnerable. And then secondly, I really want to also emphasize, because I think this is another point of confusion for people, any child who is created, any child who is born, who, who was conceived through IVF is a beautiful blessing, <laughs> of course. And um, I would say that, you know, God can bring good out of anything. And that child is the good that comes from even when we pursue these, these types of treatments um, for that creation, you know? Such an important point. And I know it, it, it makes the conversation all the more sensitive. You have people really suffering yes. through infertility. And then you have those that were IVF you know, conceived or they are parents that have children conceived in IVF, a niece or a grandchild. And it's so personal. And like you say, these children are the whole point of why IVF is fraught and a problem is not because life isn't precious, but because life is precious. Yes. And that these children who are conceived, every single one of them, the ones that made it, the ones that are frozen and the ones that have been destroyed, every single one of them are, are so precious. And that's the reason we're talking about this. Yeah. That's the why, reason this matters. Um, I do have a question about mm -hmm. the process of, you mentioned the, you know, the, the embryo growing in the, in, the, in the dish and then it's transferred after maybe five days. 
after, when it's a few hundred cells at this point, what is the longest time the embryo can develop without being transferred? At what point does it need implantation uh, or can you kind of generate or simulate some sort of implantation experience? Obviously I'm getting into the other controversy of the development of the potential development of artificial wombs here. What has been done so far in the space that you know of? Yes, and so typically the embryo by um, day seven of his or her life, we really, again, naturally, that embryo is already undergoing that process of implantation at that point. There's this really, it's very interesting. There's this window of implantation that exists in the uterus. It's just so beautifully timed in our bodies. Mm. It's such a miracle for any of us to be here um, because there's a, like a 24 hour time frame where the, the it's almost like I think of it like this window opens up in the uterus and there are these um, structures called penopodes. They, mm. they beckon and um, there's a crosstalk from the embryo coming into the uterine cavity and then, and the penopodes coming out from, you know, at the, the endometrium and then pulling that embryo in mm. and then that window shuts. And so that's why when we think about progesterone, which is a very important reproductive hormone, the timing of progesterone is critically mm. important because it opens and shuts that window of implantation. Mm. Anyway, the um, so, so that whole process has to occur at a very precise time. When we think about artificial wombs and that... Um, burgeoning technology, um, I, they might be able to simulate that process by the administration of these hormones in a very precise manner. It's similar to what's done during frozen embryo transfer cycles. Simulate that process in a live woman or simulate that process in some artificial womb. You know, as of, I think even 2017, there, there were reports that, you know, some scientists have been successful in developing a baby sheep in a bio bag, as they call it, you know, an artificial womb, and bringing the baby to term, the baby sheep to term. So I know we haven't heard any reports that that's been done successfully on a human, but that leads to a whole other question about what what are the more what's the morality around artificial wombs? Well, even artificial rooms, but also Lila, there is it it it's been done already where they're developing embryo-like, that's what they call them, um, embryos from stem cell derived um, tissue. So what that means is this is not an embryo created from an egg and a sperm. They're manipulating stem cells, which are what we call totipotent. So they have the potential to become mm -hmm. any sort of cell in the body. And what they're doing is that they're creating an embryo specifically from the stem cell. And um, they allowed that embryo to grow to like day seven or even a little bit longer. Um, and that then opens up a whole so Pandora's box. So that embryo box. would have, if any, one biological parent, but it's not even clear how the bond of like mother, child, father, child, if the stem cell was from a man or a woman Correct. Or it's even, unclear. again, soul, right? You think about all these mm. different, it's very, um, it feels very um, otherworldly, almost like it just shouldn't, it's, it's mm -hmm. crazy. So, and then there's cloning yes. in addition. And cloning as well. So there's a whole host of different technological, again, things t coming down the pipeline. And this is the end of what we're already dipping our toe into now, which is again, the reason why this isn't just to help the embryos that are created and sitting in storage indefinitely now. This is a call for us to examine what are we doing and why are we setting ourselves up for something like this down the road? Um, it's, it's, very scary. What's the interest in cloning? I mean, I, I've seen uh, it talked about now. It's talked been talked about for decades, and there have been you know animals that have been cloned, like Dolly the sheep, mm -hmm. and there have been even among very pro-abortion, super pro-IVF scientists. There's you know in the West, anyways, there seems to be some reticence to go whole hog on cloning. I've seen alternate, um, you know, I think it was some Chinese scientists in labs talking about how they will be experimenting with it. So we don't know what's happening in other countries. 
what are the ethical issues? Walk us through what cloning is and then what are the ethical issues with cloning? Yes. And so again, cloning would be to um, phys- to replicate that person's DNA, to replicate that person ultimately would be the ultimate um, uh fruition of that, um, similar to Dolly the sheep, okay? but And when you say replicate the person, make a genetically identical person. Correct. And it, But that is, is that the same as a genetically identical twin? So it wouldn't, it could be, but here's the issue. This is again, the hubris of man, because we are, we think that we can do that. There are so many levels by which we develop, be it from, again, our chromosomes, mm. then form different proteins. There are what we call epigenetics. So that is certain factors that silence or turn on and off our genes from being expressed. Then there are cellular factors and you kind of go from micro to macro level, all mm. of the very complex interactions that exist to make us who we are, which is why twins, identical twins, who are chromosomally the same, are are not are not in reality and it not is only, amazing that yeah. that truth that you can have two genetically uh, identical human beings you know and they're very different in personality even in some of the things they struggle with physically right some of their physical ailments or uh, development can look different that's right because yeah. again of all the layers on top of simply the genes, even the mother's womb during pregnancy, and then of course the environmental influences after they're born. And so for us to think that we can just very easily, oh, we'll just uh, clone a human being, no problem, and not to understand that by manipulating these things, we might be opening that person up to an increased risk of cancer, for example. There might be so many other um, downstream effects that we have no clue about that um, that are present. It's just it's it's not it's not good science. Are there <laughs> health risks to IVF conceived babies after birth? We talked about obviously all of the lethal risks to them before birth and what they're put through. But after birth, I've heard that there are studies that indicate that there can be health issues for these kids. Yes, there there are issues for both, for both the mothers and for the babies. And so for the children born to IVF. Um, and to ICSI, which is that um, sperm injection into the egg, there seems to be an increased risk of birth defects. Um, There's about a third increase over the um, baseline population general risk, which is about 2 to 4%. And so that's one of them. A second one seems to be an increase potentially in certain cancers, so such as leukemia or hepatic um, tumors. And then there's a question of an increased risk of autism or other... uh, And this is just because the child went through the IVF process. Well, we aren't sure exactly what it is. Is. We aren't sure if it's because for some of those children, they otherwise, because of the fertility factors involved, um, that may have played a role versus the technology that was used itself. And so that part isn't clear. It's an association, not necessarily causative. But we do see that those uh, that those risks increase. That's for children and for moms and even um, in, in pregnancy specifically. Mothers uh, have significant um, increase in risk from four-time increased risk of stillbirth, um, which is- Mothers who go through IVF. Yes. Four-time increase in stillbirth. In stillbirth of those babies. Are women told that when they go to IVF clinics? Is that made clear to them that that is a risk? I think that most doctors would absolutely explain the risks, Mm -hmm. both short-term and long-term. But I also think, I know when I went with my father who was dealing with cancer, so different specialty, I'm a physician, I felt like I walked away with 50% of that information in my head. It was very, it was just a a plethora of information coming at me. And so I didn't hear all of it. And so I wouldn't be surprised if that didn't register when you're thinking about the numbers of pregnancy Mm -hmm. and whatnot. But yes, four times increased risk of stillbirth. There are issues with placental um, accreta where the placenta gets stuck into the wall of the uterus and that can cause life-threatening hemorrhage or removal of your uterus. There's an increased risk of um, hypertensive disorders which can cause seizures, like for example, preeclampsia or eclampsia or can be deadly. Um, Diabetes, um, perinatal... uh, 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 mortality or morbidity. So they have an increased risk of having to be in the ICU. Um, so there are, yes, there are real risks that have a relative increase when you undergo IVF. 
I want to get to the politics briefly. This has been so helpful. And I know folks listening, it's very eye-opening to understand step-by-step what IVF entails, the risks, the harm, some of these ethical issues with it. Uh, Is there anything else that you think people should know about IVF that isn't commonly understood? I would say that again, the human condition is always to hope. And so many couples, they hear that IVF may work and it's internalized as it will work. But IVF overall, when we look at the data, has about a, um, depending on how you also analyze the data and what the denominator is, it's about a third of the time you have a live birth out of the cycles performed. And so Again, I think that that isn't always clear to people, that people um, for some reason think it's 100%, right? Which again, I, I understand it's, it's normal to feel very hopeful and you're putting so much of your time and emotions and the physical part of having to undergo all these medications and the cost, um, the emotional toll, the marital toll. Um, but it's, there, it's not the panacea that it, is thought to be. We're going to do a part two to talk about the positive solution and recommendations for couples that face infertility and just general women's health. So I'm very excited for that. So folks who are listening, that episode will be coming out in the near future. Uh, I do want to address what's happening right now politically. I know that you paid, you're paying attention to it. Obviously, we all are. And just any of your thoughts on it. So Alabama Supreme Court recently ruled that the parents of children who had been destroyed negligently in an IVF clinic in Alabama could bring a wrongful death lawsuit and seek, uh, you know, some kind of recompense for what they endured, having their children just smashed, basically. And that was seen largely, you know, in the pro-life community as a step forward. I certainly thought, yes, at least this child in this IVF clinic has basic legal status that their parents can at least sue when the when the child's killed. I mean, it seems so baseline, right? It wasn't, you know, the Alabama Supreme Court had some nice rhetoric about the value of human life, but they did not rule that these children have equal status to other preborn children in the state of Alabama because a, a, a abortion is largely illegal in Alabama. Mm-hmm. So you can't kill your preterm, your preborn baby if you're carrying him or her, but you can still destroy your or unfreeze, let allow to die your preborn embryo in a IVF clinic. So that's the the crazy thing about this is that that could still happen, but the IVF clinics didn't like the additional legal risks that they may endure because of this new wrongful death lawsuit that can be taken, you know, brought against them and so some of them threatened to shut down. Q outrage, uh, you know, you have then pro-life Republican uh, lawmakers and you have the governor of the state who is pro who has said she's very pro-life then vote on legislation that removes any criminal or civil liability from IVF clinics in the state, which was just a wild thing to do when you think about it. Now, if you're a parent, you wouldn't be able to even bring a wrongful death lawsuit if the IVF clinic is criminally negligent. Negligent. So I'd love your just take on that. And and if you have any thoughts too, just on the fact that this happened in in a pro-life state, you know, there was so much outrage and furor over the Alabama Supreme Court decision, which was so limited in, it, in what it ruled, that you have pro-life people say they're not, not only are preborn babies in IVF clinics not of equal status to preborn children in the womb, but you can do whatever you want to them. And even the parents of those children don't have legal recourse. Yes, I think that it really, Lila, highlights the question that we all have to stop and ask ourselves. When, when does life begin again? And it's a hard reality to realize that those embryos should be afforded the same rights as everyone else were fighting for. And it's a, yeah, like you said, we can't make a distinction between wanted versus unwanted. They have unalienable rights. Those embryos do. So that's the first point. I think the second point in relation to specifically that is that it really was a huge step backwards of protection for the couples that are undergoing these fertility treatments because, again, error may happen. And uh, 
And if it's clear negligence that caused that, like leaving, it, I, I don't the know door all unlocked. the specifics, but to the me, the door, door was unlocked, unlocked and to a crazy have, person walked in and smashed. To, correct. To be able to access an children. embryology lab seems very. Um, it should be like a bank, right? I mean, I would think it's like and a bank usually, and the money is behind the It is. And the money's behind is. the safe. So I I don't understand how that was even possible. Number one, how they could access that without anybody stopping them. Um and And not uh, just access, but get in there and have take the time to destroy right. some of these children. So smash them. Right. And so um all of those things being said. To me, that is, uh, again, a huge step backwards for the parents if that situation ever occurs again, that they their hands are now tied. Their hands are now tied that, they're, uh, that there is no protection for them. So I do. I, I, I think people are very emotional about this, again, understandably. But we cannot let our intentions, um, our uh, feelings about this, override objective truth. So what do you think should happen? I, I've been asked this a lot in interviews mm -hmm. recently about IVF. Like, well, do you want to, you know, ban IVF, stop IVF? And I say, well, with all the facts that are present here about the fact that these are human lives, they have human rights, and you can't really ethically treat an embryo uh, in an IVF clinic. Like, how do you ethically treat an embryo in an IVF clinic? And some people have said to me, well, what you can do is you can just create one embryo and then make sure you implant that embryo and just do one at a time. And that would be the ethical way. And that's what I would do basically, or that's what I did do or whatever it is. Is that even going to address the infertility challenges of the couple? If IVF is done, and, and, and this is separate from the procreation unitive stuff about, well, the child deserves to be conceived in the love of their parents. I think that's a very important moral principle. But let's just say theoretically, you do IVF where you just create one embryo and you implant one embryo and you just go at it until you get a success story. What's your take on that? Well, I think they're, they're uh, first of all, what is the reason that that couple is struggling with fertility? And has every attempt been made to optimize those issues. So again, that's the principle of restorative reproductive medicine is to really dig deep at the root causes and make sure that those are corrected. You know, unexplained infertility represents anywhere from 20 to 30% of all couples. That means that they say, okay, ovulating, at least the tubes open, um, sperm look fine. But within that, there are actually a myriad of causes, for example, endometriosis or hormone imbalances that could still be addressed. And so I think the first piece of that is let's make sure we're starting at the beginning and helping these women become as healthy as possible just for their general health, for the health of their pregnancy, for the health of their, ba their baby. And so let's take it back to its beginnings. That's number one. Number two, from a standpoint of what to do next, where do we go from here? I would say that there are still potential issues with natural cycles. There's still the issue of human error. There's, um, I think, still for many people, that um, chance every month is not going to be certainly above 50%, like it isn't even when you use multiple embryos. And so it will require many cycles and a lot of money potentially. So I don't know if practically will ever be the uh, predominant way of approaching it. I will say from a, um, from a, you know, from a, I don't know if legal, I don't think that's the right word, but from the standpoint of moving everything in the right direction, mm -hmm. I think that that's a much better approach that at least tries to respect that embryo's life. Mm -hmm. And so if we can kind of get ourselves to that as opposed to where we are currently, that is a step in the right direction in my estimation. And what's your message? So you, you used to do IVF, you left IVF. We're going to get in, in a future episode into your care, your practice now and all the amazing things you're doing. What's your message to people who may be listening on the other side of the coin, not the parents who are struggling with infertility, but you know, people in healthcare who believe they're doing maybe a good work, they're trying to help families. You were in that, you were in those shoes. Yes, absolutely. Again, we are all that's why we went into medicine was to help. And that's why the parent, for everyone involved, I have to say, 
I understand we all have those good intentions. We all um, want to help you. But at, at what price, number one? And number two, I think when we, when we really sit down and we think about it in our heart of hearts, there is discomfort at being involved in these decisions mm-hmm. in some way. And for many of us, I know, again, for myself, it was a defense mechanism. I just squashed it. So I, you know, and I was said, I need to focus on, on trying to have this outcome that um, this couple so desperately wants. And so we need to not ignore that discomfort. Mm-hmm. We need to question, why am I feeling this way? Mm-hmm. Oh, because I really do, in my heart of hearts, understand that that embryo is a new, unique, substantially whole human being. And I am making decisions about that embryo's existence. So we need to really remember that. Very important stuff. Thank you so much, Lauren. Dr. Rubal. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for joining the podcast. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the show. If you haven't already, you can do that on YouTube. Don't forget to ring that notification bell so you never miss an episode. And then also subscribe on podcast apps on Spotify or on Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. We also have our Patreon and our Locals communities, which are growing. That's how you can help the podcast reach more people. Check out the link in the bio. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.